Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the e-conference on the legal implications of COVID-19 for international aviation. This event is organized by the Center for International Law at the National University of Singapore. Before we begin our discussion, we would like to inform everyone that this event is going to last for approximately 90 minutes, including the question and answer portion with our audience. To our audience, you may use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen if you have any question to our panel. You may type your questions as the discussion proceeds. Now, please allow me to introduce our moderator for today's session. She is currently the Director of Legal of the Civil Aviation Authority of Singapore. She has represented Singapore at various meetings of the International Civil Aviation Organization, or ICAO, including legal committee meetings, general assembly sessions, and international conferences that led to the conclusion of several aviation treaties. She is presently the chairperson of ICAO Legal Committee, among her other commitments. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Tan Xu Wei. Xu Wei, you, you now have the floor. Thank you very much, Emil. Welcome everyone and good afternoon from Singapore. The world is, to say the least, in a crisis. And aviation is in crisis. No doubt about it. About 90% of the world's aircraft fleet is grounded. You can go online and see beautiful photos of aircraft lined up neatly in airports, even on runways and in remote parking grounds like deserts. Beautiful, but as an aviation person and my fellow um, aviation community colleagues, really sad. There is almost no demand. The reduction in passenger travel far, far exceeds that which we saw during SARS and in the aftermath of 9-11. If you've been in aviation as long as I have, you will know that we've gone through many crises and we never thought we would come to something like this. But here we are. But I remain optimistic that international civil aviation can weather this crisis. We've been through many crises. I'm not underestimating the huge challenges that states and airlines have to restart international flights and to recover. We must, as an aviation community, and in fact, the world needs to support us to overcome the challenges, and we will. We can emerge more prepared for the next pandemic, and then we understand from the experts there will be more. We will be stronger and more resilient. In this session, my fellow speakers, Jeff Shane, Cao Ting-Song, and Dr. Jonathan Alec, who are all in the aviation field, will focus not on how bad the situation is, but rather on how aviation is trying to restart and to eventually recover. What legal challenges do we face? What are governments and regulators doing? What are the possible future regulatory and other changes? What is ICAO doing? And what about the other international organizations? And by this, I'm not talking only about WHO and other governmental organizations. I'm referring also to the industry organizations. We will address the question of whether the existing international legal framework is able to address issues that have emerged. And if not, what legal measures need to be considered? We will start with Jeff Shane, followed by Zhao Ting Song, Dr. Jonathan Alec, and I will be the last speaker, and then we will have a session of Q's and A's, questions and answers. And we will try our best to share with you uh, when we go through also through, the, through that section. So to start off, let me say a few words about Jeff. Jeff is currently the general counsel of IATA. He joined in April 2013. 
I understand he's having a, one of the best times of his life. Before joining Ayata, Jeff was a partner at Hogan Lovells in Washington. And before that, he had a long career in the US government. He held three, not just one, three presidential appointments, including Under Secretary of Transportation for Policy between 2003 and 2008. And it's during that time that I had the pleasure of getting to know Jeff when he was president of the um, General Assembly uh, in, in ICAO. And I was one of the um, chairs of the commissions. Jeff is recognized for his role in establishing an open skies aviation policy for the United States, among other things. He's told me I shouldn't say too much about him, so I'm going to be very brief. Uh, he's currently a member of the FAA's Management Advisory Council, among other things. So without further ado, Jeff, may I pass over to you, please? Well, thank you, Sue Wei, and, um, and thank you, not, not just for the introduction, but for capturing the mood of this industry so so well and in such a heartfelt way. I think you've really, uh, you've done it justice. It is a, a very difficult time. But I thought I would um, swing back and provide a little background that may set a, a context for the discussion that we're going to have today. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that the modern era of aviation began with the treaty uh, in Chicago in 1944. We call it the Chicago Convention, but it's the Convention on International Civil Aviation. And I want to mention that. I don't want to talk about it too much, but it, it, it created the rules of the road that we live with even today, 75 years, 76 years later, as well as having created the institutions that ensure that those rules of the road remain current and fit for purpose. Um, it's, I, I will say one thing about the Chicago Convention. It, its creation was a remarkable story in itself. It's one of the most amazing feats of diplomacy I, I am aware of. Uh, think about it, 1944, the war was still raging in the Pacific and in Europe. It would go on in Europe for another six months, another nine months in the Pacific. Uh, it, it took place only six months and a day after the invasion of Normandy, but the war was still going on. Yet 52 nations sent delegates to Chicago and they spent a month in a hotel uh, cobbling together a treaty that has, for all intents and purposes, stood the test of time. There have been very few amendments to it. Uh, that is an interesting story. We won't spend much time on that story today because it's, it's not really relevant to the the topic that we're here to talk about. But it is important to know that um, the delegates to Chicago were, they knew two things. They knew that civil aviation, international civil aviation would be essential to an enduring peace. That was the first thing they knew. The second thing they knew is that there could not be a successful global civil aviation system without harmonized rules governing international flight everywhere. They knew that if, if, if an airplane were going to take off from Singapore, uh, the pilot would have to be confident that when she lands in Delhi, uh, she understands the signals and the maps and the, what's being said. It, it has to be consistent or there cannot be a global system. That was the underpinning of the Chicago Convention and the delegates succeeded. Uh, they not only created uh, a lot of rules and a lot of annexes to the convention, which are still there and have been updated over time, but they created the institution that we rely on today, which is the International Civil Aviation Organization based in Montreal, ICAO, we call it. Uh, and I'm mentioning ICAO because I'll come back to ICAO and its role today, uh, vindicating the wisdom of the delegates to Chicago in 1944. A year later, uh, the world came together and created another institution. It's the one I work for, the International Aviation, the International Air Transport Organization. Uh, we uh, are also based in Montreal. In fact, we're right across the street from ICAO. Uh, our logos are actually quite similar, and sometimes people mistake IATA for ICAO and vice versa, but the fact is, ICAO is a specialized agency of the United Nations, whereas IATA is a private trade association. 
but we're much more than your usual trade association. In addition to the advocacy and the things that you expect a trade association to do, we have lots of products and services. We provide a lot of business intelligence to the industry. We set standards for the industry. You're familiar with them. Every time you buy an electronic ticket, that electronic ticket is delivered pursuant to an IATA standard. The tags on your luggage, those barcodes, those are an IATA standard. There are lots of other standards that you don't see that are behind the scenes, but are essential to the, to the very fabric of the, of the industry. And perhaps uh, for present purposes, the most important thing I should tell you about IATA is that we run a global back office system for the industry. We settle airline accounts, accounts with travel agents, accounts with airports, accounts with uh, airlines that have uh, business with other airlines. Uh, and it's because of that, those settlement systems, we call them banking and settlement programs around the world. And we, we have them for cargo as well, which has been a very important part of the business lately, as you all know. It's because of those systems that we, we, we are able to monitor the health, the economic health of the industry in real time. Uh, and as Sue will have said, it has not been a pretty picture in that regard. <clears throat> Excuse me, in the beginning, <coughs> sorry, in the beginning, the, uh, the industry, it's fair to say, was highly regulated. Uh, there wasn't much competition. Uh, governments owned their airlines for the most part and treated them as public utilities. Uh, they certainly served uh, that purpose. Um, and the net result was that aviation for the first few decades, while it grew, it did not grow robustly. Uh, that system of, of regulation and even price fixing, which was done, believe it or not, at IATA through uh, so-called traffic conferences, uh, prices in aviation were set in effect very much in the same way that prices for ocean shipping were set in, in conferences of carriers themselves. The carriers would organize the price and then submit them to governments and governments would approve them in, in, the, in most cases. Uh, that all began to change uh, in the late 70s. You will be aware, I think, that in 1978, the United States deregulated its very large domestic market. But at the same time it deregulated the domestic market, it began uh, attempting to liberalize international uh, uh, services to and from the United States, but it had to do that. It couldn't, it couldn't simply deregulate them unilaterally. It had to do it through uh, bilateral negotiations. The one thing that the, they did not do in Chicago in 1944 was establish market access, uh, the rules governing who gets to fly where. Uh, it was too hard to do in 1944. There were just too many different uh, levels of development and sophistication, and so it was simply uh, beyond reach. So they set the rules of the road, the mechanics, the nuts and bolts of the system, but the market access agreements had to be done bilaterally and, and have continued to be done bilaterally ever since. Um, again, in the beginning, those bilaterals were, were highly mercantilistic. They were essentially reciprocal deals. They were trade agreements, trade and air services, uh, in which the providers from each side could be pretty well assured of having an equal share of the market. There was very little competition. There was a lot of protectionism. Again, in the 1970s, after the U.S. domestic deregulation took place, the U.S. began pushing its trading partners for more liberal arrangements, getting away to some extent from all of the micromanagement of the industry, that led finally to 1992 when the United States did its first open skies agreement with the, with the Netherlands, uh, in which all the wraps were taken off, basically. Um, there was no limit on capacity. Nobody could tell you where to fly. Nobody could tell you whether or not an airline from one side or the other could even enter the market. All of that was going to be done in keeping with commercial considerations. Uh, it was shortly after that that the airlines from the U.S. and the Netherlands, KLM from the Netherlands and, and Northwest Airlines from the U.S. in this case, formed uh, an alliance and asked for antitrust immunity. And the United States De Department of Transportation awarded that antitrust immunity the first time 
a, a, a pair of competitors was allowed to collaborate in that way. They wanted very clearly to operate as a single entity and the United States allowed that to happen. That clearly established an entirely new model for international aviation. And all I'll say about that is that it, it led to dramatic growth thereafter. Uh, low cost carriers began coming into the market, not just domestically, but internationally for the first time. Uh, we began to see uh, a, a level of growth in the industry like we've never seen before. People could afford to fly. It democratized international aviation in ways we hadn't seen. Uh, it was a remarkable development. It was uh, a development that produced a very robust airline industry in most parts of the world. So where are we today? <laughs> it's because there was such growth and such prosperity and so much privatization as a result of, of that prosperity. Uh, Government-owned airlines being offloaded by their governments, turned into private enterprises, becoming very competitive and very good at what they did. Um, all of that came crashing down with the COVID crisis. Uh, as I said, IATA has these settlement programs around the world, so we keep very close track of what's going on in the industry. And I can tell you, according to our last count, we expect revenues in 2020 in the global airline industry to be reduced by about $314 billion. Put a different way, you could say that um, the airlines globally in 2020 will earn about 45% of the revenues they earned in 2019. That is, as Sue said, unprecedented. We've never seen anything like it. 9-11 was child's play compared to the SARS, uh, all the other viruses that we've dealt with. No, nothing has had an impact on the industry like the COVID-19 crisis. So what are we doing about all of that? Um, I indicated to you that one of the things we do as a trade association is, of course, IATA advocates. Um, you can imagine that uh, ICAO, again, in charge of the rules of the road, would come together very quickly, and they have to try to figure out what can be done in order to keep some semblance of air transport going. Uh, the result has been a tremendous amount of activity at ICAO, a tremendous amount of activity at IATA, and a tremendous amount of activity within each of the states that depends on uh, civil aviation for its economic well-being. Uh, on the advocacy front, I will tell you that one of the things uh, we've been focused on a lot uh, at IATA is just making sure that uh, governments support their airlines to the extent possible. This has been a tough, a tough argument because of course every industry uh, feels that it deserves support. It's not just airlines that keep governments going, that keep societies functioning. It's a lot of other businesses as well. Uh, but I'm, I'm pleased to say that governments have stepped up uh, in the case of the airlines in a very impressive way. Uh, we count about $133 billion uh, as of uh, our most recent count, both cash infusions and an agreement to reduce certain costs, reduce taxes, reducing fees, and that sort of thing. Um, that's been very important. There are a lot of other regulatory waivers that we've been seeking, waivers of rules that require airlines to uh, fly a certain number of slots in order to keep those slots, um, to give uh, vouchers instead of refunds. This has been a tough one for governments because when we say an airline which has no cash uh, should be allowed to give a, a voucher instead of a refund to a passenger whom it has not been able to carry because the market was closed, uh, we're asking a politician in effect to decide between an airline on the one hand and a voter <laughs> on the other. And so we fully expect that, that governments are going to have difficulty with that. And so it's been a very mixed bag but we continue to push. We push generally on seeking waivers of the consumer protection rules that we normally rely on, but which just don't seem fit for purpose in a circumstance like this. What, what are the obstacles now? I mean, the most important thing, as, as Sue said, is to get the industry going again. And there again, ICAO, 76, 75 years old, uh, 76 years old, um, has really stepped up and uh, it produced a, a, a task force almost immediately called the, the COVID Aviation Recovery Task Force. They are producing a paper that should be available on Monday, I believe. Um, 
IATA has been working alongside ICAO as part of that task force, working with leading states to ensure that the rules that emerge from this process will be harmonized, and that most importantly, we can get markets open again, instill confidence in passengers again through uh, medical uh, procedures, through screening, through assurances that you can get on an airplane without any fear of being infected. We think the evidence for that, by the way, is extremely good because there have been very few examples of anybody getting infected on an aircraft, but people have to have confidence. And in order to open the market again, in order for borders to be reopened, governments have to have confidence in each other. That is, the passengers who get on an airplane in your country have got to go through a procedure that I'm comfortable with so that I can welcome them to my country. If we don't have those sorts of understandings and mutual recognition of of the procedures which governments are going to establish in order to ensure no second wave, no further infection, uh, it'll be a much slower recovery. So uh, both ICAO and IATA and lots of other institutions uh, are working very hard to establish consistent globally harmonized protocols such that uh, we can begin to get this industry moving again. Uh, I worry, and this is the last thing I'll say, that uh, because there isn't going to be much of a market for a while, there, however quickly we're able to get things restarted, demand will be slow in coming back. People's disposable income has been decimated. The working capital of companies has been decimated. A lot of travel that would normally take place may not travel, may, may not happen for a while. And what that means is that it's, it's, I worry whether or not we're going to maintain the pro-competitive framework for international aviation that we have been enjoying since the late 70s. Uh, will open skies agreements continue to seem fit for purpose? Personally, I certainly hope so. But it may very well be that in order to just establish the connectivity which governments will insist upon, uh, they may not feel that they can rely on the whim of the market to provide that connectivity, and they may start instructing airlines. We've seen some of that already in, in the United States and some in Australia, perhaps Jonathan can talk about that. Um, I just don't know. Uh, there, there may have to be more traditional interlining among airlines than we have seen in a long time uh, with the advent of alliances, just to get people from one place to another because the non-stops that were there before may not be available. So a tremendous amount of work has to be done. I'm not going to talk about the regulatory side of it and because we have uh, regulators uh, sitting on this panel and I'll, I'll defer to them. But uh, suffice it to say that when you want to start an airplane that has been on the ground for several weeks, it's not like putting the key into the ignition and turning it. <laughs> a regulatory, a whole regulatory apparatus comes into play uh, in order to ensure the safety of that operation. Licenses of pilots and others uh, which have been, who have been idled for a while need to be recertified and revalidated. Uh, there, there are all those details, uh, which are other obstacles. We're working on those as well, to, uh, be clear. But the, the big issue is how quickly can we persuade governments to reopen markets and, re and persuade passengers to get back on airplanes and start flying again. So, Sue, I'll stop there. Uh, I hope I haven't talked too long, uh, but um, I'm looking forward to hearing what our, my colleagues on the panel have to say. Thank you very much, Jeff. I think you've really made the job very much easier for the rest of us. Um, you've done a great sweep of um, aviation from its birth. Uh, to the crisis that it has faced, and especially the current one, and also outlined, um, you know, some of the responses from IATA and, um, you know, airlines as well as governments, and and what you see, um, you know, regulators also need to, to do. So I'm going to turn now to um, Mr. Cao Jingsong, who is um, from China. Um, he is an associate research uh, fellow of the International Cooperation and Service Center which is associated with the Civil Aviation um, Administration of China. Uh, he works closely with them. Um, he specializes in general international uh, law, international organization law, and international air law. Um, I've come to know Jing Song also, uh, had the privilege of um, meeting and working with him at IKEO meetings. He joins the Chinese delegation in a number of meetings, uh, including the Rome 
convention modernization, the Beijing Convention and Beijing Protocol, and more recently in the Tokyo Convention modernization, which resulted in the Montreal Protocol 2014. Um, he's also published uh, many books and papers. I think there's a lot of interest in what's happened in China, what China is doing, and I'll turn you over to Jing Song to um, share with us. Jing Song. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, thank you, Derek Tang. Uh, it's good to join you. First of all, thank you for your excellent organization and your hospitality uh, to invite me to join the seminar. Uh, I'm John Yi Song from International uh, Cooperation and Service Center under the CAAC. The center is to promote uh, international cooperation and exchange in civilization fields. Uh, so today, what I have said represent, uh, do not represent the Chinese civilization authority, uh, just for scholar views. Uh, as we know, uh, in January 2020, uh, the outbreak of COVID-19 brings great challenge to humankind society. Uh, we said that uh, the major infectious disease is the public enemy of humankind. And we know it also brings great challenges to uh, international civil aviation industry. So I think it's very necessary for us to come together to have a discussion on how to make our global aviation industry out of difficulties from the legal perspective. And uh, today, uh, my speech, my title speech is uh, the prevention and the control of China's civil aviation against COVID-19 from the perspective of uh, international aviation law. Uh, my my speech is divided into three parts. Uh, the first is about the bilateral air service agreement, and the second is on commission on the uh, law of treaty, and the third is uh, the Tokyo Convention in 1963. Now, uh, first, let me see the aviation of China in. Uh, Civil aviation of China in action, as we know, uh, in March, uh, because we are faced with uh, the serious situation uh, that is uh, the important imported cases is more and more. So uh, the CIC have already taken two important measures to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Uh, the first uh, measures is CIAC published designated the first points of entry into China for international flights bound for Beijing. And the second is notice on further reducing international passenger flights during COVID-19 prevention and control of fears. Some person uh, questioned uh, these two important measures. Uh, I think the Chinese government take this, these two important measures in, in, in complying with uh, international law, international aviation law, and the domestic law of China. First uh, is bilateral air service agreements. On April 6, 1993, the State Council approved the model Air Service Agreement of China as a model for China to sign bilateral air transport agreements with foreign countries. At present, uh, the Chinese Civil Aviation Administration have already signed 126 uh, air service agreements with foreign countries and region. And in the bilateral air service agreements, it usually covers uh, issues regarding traffic rights, use of routes, type of aircraft, 
safety standard, competition policy on ownership, design and control of airlines, race, fares, and tax uh, issues. Uh, as we see, uh, the bilateral air service agreement uh, play a very important role in different countries to negotiate the, uh, aviation talks between different countries. And uh, we, we must uh, pay attention to Article 4 and Article 5. Article 4 is about verification, suspension of additional conditions of permission. In Article 4, in any of the following circumstances, one contracting party has the right to revoke or suspend the business license of the designated air transport enterprises of the other contracting party. In Article 5, application for laws and the regulations, the laws and the regulations of one contracting party concerning the entry and the exit of aircraft engaged in international flights shall apply to aircraft designated by the other contracting party. So we see the two important articles uh, which uh, express the main ideas. The foreign airlines, foreign company, and the foreign aircraft share, comply with, obey, follow uh, the laws, regulations, and, and uh, uh, regula regulatory papers issued by host state. So, uh, we have two, two questions. The first is about can Article 4 and Article 5 of the Modern Air Transport Agreement of China be applied? Uh, my conclusion is that um, the reducing, to, redu to reduce uh, international flight can be applied Article 5. And, and because Article, Article 4 is suspend and uh, suspend the international uh, flights. So uh, the two important measures taken by CAC share comply with uh, bilateral air service agreement and also comply with domestic law of China. Uh, we can see in Article 2 and uh, Article 3 of the civil aviation of the People's Republic of China. Uh, the article two is that uh, talking about uh, the sovereignty and, and uh, article three talking about the functions, the duties of the civil aviation authority. The civil, uh, civil aviation authority have the power to issue the law regulations and the regulatory papers to manage uh, the civil aviation operation. And we also see uh, the front, frontier health and the quarantine law of the People's Republic of China. And this article provides that during the crisis, uh, the Chinese government can take special measures to, uh, to prevent the spread of the COVID-19. Uh, another question is about can the 1944 Convention on International Civil Aviation be applied? That is also called the Chicago Convention in 1995, in, in, 19, in 1944. Uh, there are about uh, five articles can apply. First it is about sovereignty and uh, Article 2 uh, Article 10, landing and the customer's airport, and Article 11, applicability of air regulations, and Article 13, entry and clearance and regulations, Article 14, prevention of spread of disease. These five articles express the main uh, contents is that uh, we sh share respect and comply with and uh, follow the territory jurisdiction of host uh, host state 
which is the legal basis of modern international law. Since, since the Westphalia, Westphalia uh, international system in, 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 in 17th century to now. Uh, the, the second part is about the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Uh, the, the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties is, uh, was, born, was born on May 20. Third in 1960, in 1969, China is a party to this convention. And the very famous important article is, is Article 7062, fundamental changes of circumstances. Uh, that's to say, if we meet with the two, two conditions, the government can invoke a fundamental changes of circumstances of the ground for suspending the operation of the treaty. So uh, in, in this special crisis, the Chinese government can invoke this uh, fundamental change, changes of circumstances to, to exempt uh, the obligation under the bilateral air service agreement. Uh, we can see uh, one, two, three. Uh, this important accident ex expressed that uh, uh, epidemic uh, COVID-19 constitute a great crisis after the World War the World War Two. And the third is uh, Tokyo Convention. And the Tokyo Convention, the main purpose. Uh, is to maintain basic safety and order uh, in the cabin, especially about uh, the power of air aircraft commander. Uh, the scope of, of air exercise of uh, power in Article 5, that is in flight, uh, an aircraft shall be deemed to be in flight at any time from the end of loading, when the doors outside the cabin are closed until any cabin doors is open for, for up loading. Why we refer to this uh, Tokyo Convention? Because during the crisis, uh, especially in airport, uh, some uh, passengers with a fever uh, was refused to board an aircraft some persons question th th uh, this issue. I, I think um, because uh, the Tokyo Convention uh, have entrusted aircraft commander to dis dis disbarking uh, the passenger from the aircraft in order to protect the public safety, public healthy uh, of uh, uh, for, for the uh, civil aviation operation. So uh, we can see that it is allowed to disembark from the aircraft, but aircraft commander's executive power cannot extend to the checking counter or the covered bridge. And the scope of executive power is within the, the aircraft that close the cabin door. This is uh, uh, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Jing Song. Thank you um, for sharing with us um, some of the issues that have been considered um, in China. Uh, we turn now to um, Jonathan Alec. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Alec is head of the Legal, International and Regulatory Affairs at the Civil Aviation Safety Authority, in short, CASA, in Australia. Between September 1998 to August 2003, he served as Australia's representative in the Council of the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, and he has rep represented Australia ever since and probably before. 
in a number of international aviation meetings and conferences, including the last assembly and the last session of the ICAO Legal Committee. Before and um, since arriving in Australia in 1988, he has combined a professional and academic career as a lawyer, a legal policy consultant, and a university lecturer. He's a member of the Australian Institute of Administrative Law, having served two terms as president of the Institute. He's also vice chair of the Flight Safety Foundation's Legal Advisory Committee and a fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society. And of course, I cannot resist mentioning that Jonathan is also a good friend. We met way back in 1999, 98, and uh, we've worked um, very well in IKEO matters and also regulatory matters ever since. Over to you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you, Xu Hui, and, and, and thanks to both of you. I can uh, have the advantage of what you both had to say from different perspectives. I want to speak briefly from a particular perspective about the special role of the civil aviation regulatory authorities in contributing to the successful navigation of air transport um, through and hopefully out of this genuinely unprecedented crisis. This contribution involves two elements from my perspective. First, providing and responding to the need for relief from regulatory requirements right now that unnecessarily exacerbate operational and to that extent commercial burdens at this very critical time. And secondly, facilitating the resumption of operations where these have been curtailed or suspended entirely uh, for what in some cases has been and will be an extended period of time. Now, while regulators conventionally endeavor to reconcile the two complex and sometimes competing public demands for safety on the one hand and the commercial and economic vigor of the industry on the other, in attending to the demands uh, we are facing in the current climate, we are obliged to strike a delicate balance among three critical public interests. First, maintaining aviation safety while sustaining or at least minimizing adverse impacts on industry viability. And thirdly, uniquely, ensuring at the same time that vital public health concerns are effectively addressed. Now, contrary to the popular assumption that adherence to law is, and some might say should be, uh, an early and acceptable casualty in the face of existential crises, it's been heartening, I think, to find that there does seem to be broad recognition of the importance of the continuing fidelity to the rule of law and the principle of legality among all stakeholders. In the international aviation sector, uh, this is particularly evident as we confront the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. But what's more, while our ability to, to deliver on the three demands to which we are working hard to respond has been tested, it is working, and as Jeff suggested, it's working remarkably well in all the circumstances. This is not always easy to ensure, but it can be and is being done. And it's a commitment that needs to endure beyond the current crisis. Corresponding to the call for greater international collaboration and cooperation in the effort to restore air transport and related services as quickly as possible, while responding to the sometimes seemingly inconsistent requirements of safety, economic and commercial survival at this point with a view to future growth and the overarching expectations in terms of public health, federated polities like Australia and widely dispersed regions like the Pacific Island community face unique logistical and in the first instance, sometimes constitutional challenges, along with the underlying economic and health related difficulties shared in common by every country. These factors throw up compelling requirements for a level of national comity and regional cooperation that might not have been seen feasible only a few months ago. In the midst of these fundamental preoccupying concerns, regulatory authorities must also be alive to two corollary considerations. First, exceptional but palpable instances in which the supportive and flexibly responsive regulatory framework we are fashioning may be gamed and misused to the advantage of some, but to the disadvantage of all. And secondly, 
there is a need for a rational and circumspect assessment at the right time of which adaptations can and should be retained for continued application when this is over. How much relief, that, how much of the relief that we've introduced can and should be continued in a business as usual regulatory climate without necessarily normalizing arrangements that really are best reserved for extraordinary circumstances. Having learned that surgery can be carried out in wartime field hospitals without anesthetic, no one would advocate for the elimination of anesthesia when it's readily available. And where cannibalism may have staved off starvation in the context of extended military sieges, no one would argue for the regularization of such practices on account of their efficiency and environmental advantage. We're all struggling to come to terms with realities few of us uh, ever seriously contemplated before now. We're learning lessons every day, some of these regrettably, if unavoidably, the hard way. But in the process, constructive new relationships between civil aviation regulators and the community we regulate are being forged in ways that can and should strengthen our shared commitment to the integrity of the international legal regime in which we have operated so well for so long and in which I, like I think my colleagues, uh, am confident will come to operate uh, more fully in, in the near future. Um, I've, I've kept this deliberately at a, at a somewhat high level, although both Jeff and, and uh, Zhang referred to matters that I think uh, touch very closely on the kind of concerns that we face in Australia and in this region on a regular basis. So with that, I think I'll not have exhausted my full time, but I'm happy to turn back to you, Shirley. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan, and for presenting the uh, perspective of a regulator. Um, I hope that there'll be many questions after this. Now, just at this point before I launch into sharing my um, thoughts, um, inform the audience that there is a Q&A feature for this uh, webinar, and you're uh, strongly encouraged to type in your questions and answers. And then the panelists um, will have the pleasure of addressing them after I've spoken. So please type away. We welcome all questions. And then if you would like a particular question, uh, please like. Uh, it will go to the top of the list and that uh, the ones which have the highest number of likes um, will get answered first. So um, let me just share my thoughts on this topic. Jeff has already actually covered a number of them. I'll just supplement some of the things that you said. We would have wanted to have a speaker from the IQ um, and especially the IQ Legal Bureau, but you will understand that it's when we started, it was 4 a.m. in Montreal, which is a bit challenging. And the other thing is that they are really, really um, you know, busy uh, you've heard from, from Jeff about what they're busy about. So as I said at the beginning, crisis is not at all new to aviation. And as Jeff already mentioned, in fact, modern av aviation was born in a time of severe crisis in the midst of war. And just like the crisis that we're now in, in the crisis then they saw it fit and um, beneficial to the world to develop something for aviation and thanks to them we've had a thriving aviation industry that has grown from strength to strength until we now meet this challenge it started with 52 states at that conference by 1947 uh, half of that uh, number had um, ratified and then the convention came into force in today's context to get a convention or a treaty to come into force within such a short time is a, lo a lot more challenging because today we have 193 states who are parties to the Chicago Convention. So as Jeff also said, Chicago Convention has indeed stood the test of time. Over 75 years, it's still going strong. And I say that it still provides a strong and reasonably flexible legal framework for member states and the aviation industry to come together to overcome each crisis. So what do I mean? There are, I think, two important outcomes that the founders achieved. 
One was the codification and um, of the existing rules, which were already in the Paris Agreement. They improved on it, and they also established a mechanism for um, developing standards and recommended practices. Not new, it was already there in the Paris Agreement. But the one essential difference that they did make was that they incorporated a mechanism for states when it's not practicable to uh, notify IKU that it's not possible to comply with that standard or that their um, own national requirements are in fact higher or more stringent. And we'll come to this again a bit later because this is relevant uh, in the context of COVID-19. And the second thing was, of course, they established a KO, and what's the importance of that? Well, if you write a convention or a treaty that is trying to deal with an industry like aviation that grows and develops and has many, many challenges, technological, operational, pandemics, crisis, volcanic eruption, uh, terrorism, you better have an instrument that you can use and change and adjust as necessary. So there is a mechanism and that an, an organization, the International Civil Aviation Organization that um, comes into play this role to develop within its auspices um, through working groups, through panels uh, overseen by an air navigation commission, which is supported by the secretariat and they develop standards and recommended practices, which um, go through a fairly long process, quite rigorous, involving member states um, involvement and a disapproval process just before it's, they are finalized. And of course, IKEA also has the ability and has done many times over the years, uh, brought together states in, uh, to develop international treaties and also to amend them um, as necessary. Now, specific to uh, infectious diseases and pandemics, there is an Article 14, which has already been mentioned, which entrusts states with the responsibility of preventing the spread of communicable diseases. Now, written in 1944, the, this article highlights cholera, smallpox, yellow fever, plague, and typhus. Now, if this article were written today, I'm quite sure coronavirus will be in the list. So, as I mentioned just now, and also um, Jeff and well as Jonathan has also um, already spoken about it, the standards and recommended practices um, have to be complied with by states, especially the standards, they are mandatory. And the challenge in this COVID-19 is that there are a number of um, articles and standards which the ICAO Secretariat has identified as hard um, standards. What do I mean? These standards which um, incorporate some time periods, for example, for example, a pilot, um, a pilot in command of an aircraft who has fly must within a 90-day period before the flight um, have made three takeoffs and three landings. Now, the reason for that, of course, is to ensure to all those who fly that the pilot is competent and his, ex his experience is recent. So when you have a standard like that, which has a time period, which has to be complied with, and in this COVID-19 situation where um, there is a requirement for people to stay home, not move around, we also have um, the need for them to be um, examined by medical uh, examiners that to make sure that they maintain their fitness and so on. It can be rather challenging. And so states find themselves in a position where they have made these requirements into their national legislation and regulatory requirements, but it can be difficult for the industry, the aviation personnel, et cetera, to comply with these so what has ICAO done in relation to this? There is no choice uh, among states um, that some of these standards uh, are difficult to comply with. 
So very early, ICAO identified those standards which um, states will have to have deviations on, and they must file differences if they have to deviate from those standards. And ICAO provided guidance. And also, um, th these differences have to be notified to other states, and other states have to decide whether or not they accept them. So ICAO has developed web portals um, for states to easily file this, um, to notify of the uh, deviations in the form of exemptions from these requirements, and also to file the differences, and these are temporary in nature. Now, ICAO has also um, previously, in response to SARS, developed a collaborative arrangement for the prevention and uh, management of public health events called uh, CAPSCA. And as Jeff already mentioned, um, they've also um, promoted what's called the public health corridor to enable cargo flights. The idea is to have clean aircraft, clean crew, clean airports, um, all the necessary measures, disinfection and so on. So we see that ICAO has worked with also with um, international organizations like the World Health Organization uh, to ensure that public health is maintained. If you look at the um, standards and recommended practices in a particular annex called Annex 9, which deals with facilitation, you will find that over the years, right from the beginning, ICAO has worked with WHO and developed various standards and recommended practices to deal with um, infectious diseases accelerated to a large extent after SARS and after that there's avian flu and, and so on. And it, it really makes fascinating reading if you go through all the, um, the different editions of uh, Annex 9. I won't go into that, but just to, to share with you. And more recently, of course, as Jeff has mentioned, the ICAO Council um, has established a Council Advi Aviation Recovery Task Force um, Jeff has mentioned it, so I'm not going to go into it, but as he's mentioned, in a few days, um, we should see the publication, um, the, the work from that effort, and it's going to be uh, uh, provide guidance. It's in two parts, broad principles, um, and then it will also include uh, more specific details on what states can do. Now, we have to remember that ICAO it's not a regulatory authority. It establishes standards and recommended practices, but it really relies on its member states to introduce national legislation to implement the standards and recommended practices, ICAO resolutions, and so on. And as Jonathan mentioned, regulators have to um, exercise flexibility, but rest assured there is no compromise on safety and protecting uh, public health. It's vital and very important that regulators working in hand in hand with public health authorities in their countries, with regulators in other countries, and together with industry, whether it is in their own state, the airlines, the airports, um, ground handlers, and others to put in place a regime that will restore confidence, or give confidence not only to the passengers, but also to crew that it is safe to fly on aircraft. The challenge really is when states have different requirements, it can be very, very challenging for the airlines and for passengers. And we know that um, going forward, all these challenges, um, there'll be great efforts made to address them and to make sure that there's a degree of harmonization that makes it possible for aviation to um, continue to operate uh, smoothly. It is going to be difficult. It's going to be, um, there will be differences, but for sure, every effort, I think, I believe, will be made among states because it is really vital. Aviation is just so international, so connected. It's just not possible for a couple of states or just a small number of states to really make it work. 
So let me come now just to mention about um, the financial aspect. So we've heard that states are making efforts to assist um, industry. Jeff has mentioned about the financial assistance, the challenges related to that. I'll just mention one aspect, and that's relating to, well, two actually. Um, that's relating to the air navigation service providers. Many air navigation service providers depend or have their income, especially if they're privatized or semi-privatized, on the charges that they um, impose or that are imposed on flights, which they control. And as you can imagine, with the sheer drop in these flights, uh, it is a challenge uh, to be able to um, deal with the drop in, in income. And some have to turn also to their states to, to assist them. I just want to highlight that under Article 28 of the Chicago Convention, every state actually has the responsibility to provide air navigation services which include radio services, meteorological services, and navigation facilities to facilitate international air navigation. And, I can, and there's, a, there's a civil aviation, uh, civil aviation navigation services organization called CANCEL that's also working very hard on this. It's one of the um, international organizations that I mentioned. And of course, there's also the um, Airports Council International as well that's also working together with IATA and with ECAO on addressing all these issues. So I have by no means really done a comprehensive or justice to all the efforts that are being made to, to address the situation um, and for the foreseeable future, it remains a huge challenge. But as, as I said in the beginning, and as I think, I believe you can see from among the contributions of all four of us, that there's a high degree of common interest among people who work in aviation. And we strongly believe that aviation is a great contributor to our own states. There are states who depend a lot on aviation in order to be able to um, derive their income, especially states, for example, who for, for whom uh, tourism is a very huge um, contributor to the economic um, well-being. So I think that um, with all the goodwill, good efforts, realistic um, plans, a strong will to implement them regardless of politics, we'll get there. So with that, I'd like to um, end my little presentation and I'm going to uh, turn over to the section on questions and answers. So if I can just look for the questions and answers. So I'll, I'll just answer very quickly the first one about whether speaker slides at the end of the conference will be shared. Uh, it will be shared in the form of the recording I believe. Um, the next question is, what do you think about the physical distancing protocol in aircraft in some countries where they have to reduce the seat to 50%? How do airlines or IATA respond to this? So Jeff, can I ask you about this question? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to have that question. Uh, we're seeing a very mixed performance among states. Um, I'm happy to say that most understand that there is absolutely no point in attempting to block the middle seat. Uh, there's no evidence, as I said earlier, that there has been any significant uh, rate of infection on airplanes. There's been very little anecdotally. Studies are being done to get more scientific evidence uh, of what actually happens on, on an aircraft. But the characteristics of an aircraft, its circulation system, the HEPA filters, which most state-of-the-art airplanes have, and that all airplanes will probably have before we get done with retrofitting, um, make it very difficult to actually have an infection. 
but um, I wouldn't probably have to spend a lot of time explaining to this audience that if in fact a government wants to block the middle seat on every aircraft, it's essentially confiscating a third of the inventory of the industry, confiscating a third of the inventory without compensation. Um, it's going to be very difficult for the industry to get back on its feet in the best of circumstances. But if you're allowing them to sell only two thirds of the seats, um, they're toast. Uh, we will not have any restart. We'll have many more bankruptcies than we've had already. And we've had quite a few. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that if there were evidence that blocking the middle seat actually contributed to the health of the passenger, um, but it doesn't. And um, uh, it doesn't, again, the, the most important thing to, to focus on are the health of passengers before they get on the aircraft. And that, that is what all the protocols that we and ICAO and other organizations, WHO certainly have been focused on, to try to move that assessment as far upstream as possible, ideally, even before the passenger gets to the airport. We can figure out protocols which establish the the, 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 the health of the passenger, uh, thereby speeding the, the, the boarding process, uh, bringing it back to something close to normal, uh, that would be great. But blocking seats is, um, it's, it's not helpful. And it's, it's, not, it, it's not helpful to health, and it's certainly not helpful to the industry. So uh, IATA is formally adamantly opposed to any such requirement. We've seen a little bit of the United States. Uh, some airlines have done it voluntarily in the U.S. Uh, they can afford to do it in the beginning because they're not seeing very many passengers, so there isn't any penalty. Uh, and it's, it's essentially an optical, I have to say this, it's an optical uh, proposal just in order to attract passengers to make them feel somewhat more comfortable. I suspect that they're able to block many, many more than just the middle seat right now, uh, given the number of passengers that are actually coming to the airport. But as the as the traffic begins to re rebound, uh, they will stop doing that, and um, the, no no adverse impact will be detected as a result. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. I just wonder whether Jonathan, you would like to say anything about that. Otherwise, I'm going to turn to the next question. Uh, yeah, just very quickly, as Jeff suggested, um, we find that the more effective way of allowing these um, these concerns to be addressed is to leave it to the operators themselves um, to to do what they choose to do. It is it is not in our normal course of events, and it's not part of the way we're approaching the current situation to impose a whole range of. Uh, which, as Jeff suggested, may be largely cosmetic prescriptive requirements. Um, we will look for evidence of what does and what doesn't work, but we will still rely to a great extent on the operators to make prudent choices. We're minding that. We're, we're ensuring that they're doing it in accordance with appropriate processes, but they are, for very obvious reasons, in, in the best position to want to make the best decisions. God bless you, Jonathan. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, um, Jeff and Jonathan. So the, the next question is, um, previously the conference participants have questioned the rationale for the WHO's recommendation in January at the outset of the crisis that flights from COVID-19 stricken areas or countries should not be restricted. Did this recommendation have any basis in international aviation law? How should the recommendations on travel restrictions be decided in the future? Example, should there be greater consultation with IKO and IATA? So, so Jeff, you mentioned, do you want to give it a shot first? Sorry, um, I was trying to unmute you, Jonathan. I, I, didn't, I wasn't successful. Um, <laughs> I, I can't speak to what motivated uh, WHO uh, in, in the beginning, um, I think it was their view that, again, with the right health protocols, there was no particular point in preventing uh, flights from taking place, no point in closing borders. Uh, that was quickly overtaken by national decisions to do it anyway. Um, so we, we appreciated the motivation behind WHO's uh, initial announcement. 
Uh, remember, we weren't in a pandemic quite yet. Uh, we didn't we didn't know whether it would become a pandemic. Uh, it has, and I think it probably would have become a pandemic even if borders had been closed, uh, just because you can't keep your national citizens from returning. Uh, there are a whole variety of things that that make it very difficult to stop the spread. But I'm in now way over my head. I'm not an epidemiologist, and uh, I would I would hesitate to pronounce on on anything that came out of WHO uh, from from subject matter experts. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, um, Jeff. How likely? The next question is how likely um, is it that there'll be new law? Or treaties regarding this situation? Do we really need a new one or to face this new normal and how will it look like? I think I'll ask Jonathan, do you want to start on this, a response to this question? I think there'll be a thoroughgoing reevaluation of the efficacy of the rules we have in place uh, to see whether and in which ways they can be improved. I personally don't think there'll be a wholesale change in fundamental principles. I think um, as challenging and as difficult as the situation is that we're dealing with, I think in retrospect, we will see and say that it's been managed well, and it's been managed well, as I suggested in my presentation, within the existing framework of both international and I, I'm, I might say to some extent domestic law as well in many places. So I think that what we'll see is a much more um, elaborate system of guidance and advice, uh, a, a, a much uh, more active engagement on the part of uh, members of the industry in collaboration with governments and other organizations to develop um, uh, processes and protocols for handling the situations. Um, although I'm a regulator, um, I think re really good regulators should be alive to the fact that many, many problems are not best solved with new regulations. So I think that's the approach that I'm hopeful will be taken. I would agree with that. I thought I thought Jin Song's presentation, you know, reminded us of the extent to which the treaty provisions that are already in place really are fit for purpose, even under these circumstances. It wasn't as though nobody had ever heard of a pandemic before. After all, nobody had ever heard of of, of, of issues that arise that make it impossible to comply with what the normal rules would require you to comply with. Everybody understood that there were special circumstances. Um, I, I worry a little bit that um, because different states are experiencing the pandemic at different rates, recovery is happening in different places at different times, some, some areas of the world are still experiencing increased rates of infection even today. Um, so it's going to be difficult to do what certainly I ought to hoped would be possible to see a global restart. Uh, I think it's reasonable to expect that more likely it'll be a bilateral restart that governments will come together not to redo their bilateral agreements per se but and it may not be formal consultations, but just establishing an understanding that uh, flights between country A and country B are trusted, um, that the protocols in country A and country B are trusted and recognized by the two countries. Ideally, that would be a global system. That's, I, that's exactly what ICAO is attempting to establish. That's what IATA has been arguing for and even working with states to achieve. Um, but in fact, whether it's realistic to expect it to happen in a global way, I, I'm not entirely sure. Um, we want it to happen as quickly as possible. And if it turns out that there are some areas that can restart faster than others, then I think we would all say, then let's get going. Um, let's not wait for everybody to be, to be where we want them to be. But um, I don't think to answer the question again, uh, it requires, overhauling the, the instruments that are currently in place that that really govern uh, this business. Thank you very much, Jeff. I, I will have to say that I, I agree with both of you 
I think that um, there isn't any pressing need or, or, or identified gap at the moment that requires any amendment to Chicago Convention. As I mentioned earlier, the flexibility that the mechanism of having standards and recommended practices and differences um, work very well. Um, they demonstrate that states have a, a, a desire and ICAO also promotes um, compliance with the rule of law. And I think Jonathan has, has um, elaborated on that. I think what I can, we can see in the foreseeable future is that Annex 9, which currently is the annex in which there are standards and recommended practices related to health um, you know, protect, protection measures, uh, might be um, overhauled in some way, improved. And I think the challenge really is that previously in, in, in the previous um, outbreaks, um, including in SARS, what we saw was more localized and regional outbreaks very quickly um, and did thank goodness. But the pandemic is really different. So I think that the challenge will be what are the arrangements that we need to, to handle a pandemic like this and to prevent this kind of almost complete shutdown. I think that's what we, we really need to try and, and, and prevent if possible and minimize uh, if possible. So I think I'm confident that if we put all our brains together and we work together, there is a way to, to handle it. It's going to be difficult. And I agree with you also that it's a question of starting out perhaps bilaterally, small number of countries, but um, trying to keep it open to all as much as possible and to learn from the lessons um, as, we, as we go along. Thank you. So I'm going to um, go to the next question unless Jing Song wants to say anything. I was just wondering if uh, Jin Song had anything to add. We we are all we're all watching China. China came through the peak faster than anyone else. I mean, it started before anyone else, so it's reasonable to expect that they would begin the recovery before anyone else. And as a result, flights have been coming back uh, quickly uh, with protocols. And I I'm, I'm particularly curious as as a scholar of the treaties that govern this business, whether or not in, in looking over those treaty provisions, Jinsong, you saw any gaps, whether there were uh, any openings uh, that needed to be filled uh, as a result of, uh, of this crisis. Uh, in my view about uh, some suggestion for uh, International Civil uh, Convention on International Civil Vision, and uh, some bilateral air service, air service agreement. First is uh, maybe in, in during the crisis, during the crisis uh, issue, in the maybe in Article nine, 196 of Chicago Commission, uh, some. Uh, uh, in emergency crisis uh, and this is not very clear so uh, in my memory uh, if one country invoke this article is maybe about the uh, conflict between different countries and now great changes have taken place since uh, the world world war ii and uh, the conflict is de decreasing uh, so uh, emergency crisis, just like uh, natural disaster, uh, uh, public health crisis. So um, if we want to uh, make some amendments uh, to the 19, uh, 1960 of, of Chicago Commission, we should explain the clear definition of emergency crisis. This is uh, my first uh, view. And the second uh, the view is about um, uh, the bilateral air service agreement. Uh, as we know, uh, in Chicago Convention Conference in 1944, 
uh, some countries want to establish a multilateral uh, air freedom mechanism. And uh, after the conference, uh, maybe in 1947, the UK and the United States signed the Bermuda uh, Agreement. And, and, and now it's uh, some open skies. Uh, so uh, in this bilateral agreement, that's uh, uh, in the course of normal situation for different countries. But now, uh, uh, great changes have taken place, especially for some natural disasters, public health crisis. So uh, we, sh we should make some suggestion on revise the bilateral air service uh, air service agreement to add some clause on emergency uh, emergency situation. That's to say, um, at that time during the emergency crisis, the contracting parties, uh, exempt for the obligation under the bilateral air service air service agreement. This is my two proposal just for a scholar views. Thank you, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Tifa. Okay, let's look at um, what other questions do we have. So I have this question, um, which is goes as follows. Two questions, actually. Uh, we have proposed ATS for aviation in view of the COVID-19 uh, and the aviation se sector is struggling. Do you think the ETS could be deferred? And two, second question, do you feel um, that service providers would be liable in a case if a passenger gets COVID-19 during travel or die on the flight? And will that passenger get compensation under the Warsaw system or the Montreal Convention 1999? Yes. Jeff, you, you look like you're ready to answer. <laughs> Could you please? Um, well, on the liability front, I think that would depend on the facts. Uh, I think it, as a practical matter, it'd be very difficult to prove where the infection actually arose. Uh, you have to know an awful lot about the trajectory of that particular individual uh, before and after uh, the flight. Uh, certainly if somebody died on a flight as a result of a virus, there'd be no possibility of saying the virus was contracted on the flight. This was the end of the story, not the beginning of the story. And so uh, there wouldn't be any, uh, uh, any, any issue. But I, I, <laughs> whether the Warsaw Convention would apply if indeed it could be proven, I think it's an academic issue that's quite interesting to think about. Uh, whether such a case will ever arise and be brought to court, I think is a very open question in my mind. Uh, that was the second part of the question. Could you remind me what the first first question was? Sorry, the, the screen has kind of moved and I've, I've lost that question. Yeah. I think the first question was about the ETS, whether because of the COVID-19, oh. the ETS could be deferred. Well, um, I, I, I don't know. I, we, we, would love to, <laughs> we would love it to be deferred. <laughs> We, the industry, I should say, would love it to be deferred in uh, recognition of the uh, ICAO agreement that uh, was forged a couple of years ago called Corsia, which is a carbon offset system. Uh, we are, frankly, way ahead now, thanks to the COVID crisis. If there's a silver lining on this cloud, I guess you could say it's, uh, it's, it's or maybe it's a carbon lining. I'm not sure, but it's, uh, we, we've done better. There's a funny, I should mention this, there's a, a funny anomaly uh, as a result because 2020 was meant to be the base year for offset obligations later on. Uh, and if in fact it is the base year, given the fact that we have <laughs> uh, emitted very little carbon compared to most years uh, in 2020, there really needs to be an adjustment because it's going to uh, cost airlines far more than was anticipated in order to uh, comply with their obligations if indeed 2020, this extremely anomalous year, uh, is, is meant to be the base. So we've been working within ICAO uh, 
uh, to see if we can switch the base year from 2020 to 2019, which was a normal year and which would be consistent with, I think, the party's expectations when the Corsia agreement was forged at ICAO. Jonathan, I think, would probably have some comments on that as well. I, I, I think you're right, Jeff. I think that would be a sensible way to go. Um, uh, an honest, uh, anomalous, I guess they'll refer to this one. I can paraphrase the, the Queen on that. Um, a, a number of things have been deferred in the face of the COVID crisis in the aviation sector. Um, we have, um, from extending re expiration dates for requirements to undertake certain examinations and testing, to um, the requirement to attend to matters which are financially burdensome to organizations which are struggling. So I think uh, there'll be a very serious stock take of the kinds of issues that need to be reprioritized. Um, it'll be a matter for others to decide where that sits, but I think it'll certainly be among those that are reconsidered um, in, in that process. So wait, can I just say one yes. more thing about the ETS? I, mean, I, don't, I don't fully understand all of the dimensions of the ETS, but one of the big problems that uh, IATA and its member airlines have with uh, various national or even regional schemes like ETS is that they don't appear to have any impact on the problem. Uh, collecting taxes from airlines and then uh, directing them to uh, unrelated uses or just general government use, it doesn't improve the situation. Um, it's not, it, they, they don't become a disincentive to fly. They end up raising the price of air transportation to the people that would like to use it uh, without, without beginning to solve the problem. Uh, the airlines clearly want to solve the problem. They don't feel as though they are the villains in this piece. Uh, people want to fly in normal times. They are providing the service. Uh, they would love to be able to use uh, more biofuels, sustainable aviation fuel. They have demonstrated that it can be used without even uh, any great expense in retrofitting engines. It's all available. The problem is that the the, the, the SAF, as we call it, sustainable aviation fuel, just isn't available in anything like the quantity that it needs to be available in order to solve this problem. So to, to us in the industry, the idea of telling people that they shouldn't fly, which was uh, the popular slogan not too long ago, uh, is absurd. It, 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 it doesn't make the slightest bit of sense because it would decimate economies everywhere if people stop flying. Uh, the issue is carbon. Carbon is the enemy, not the airlines. And the question is, what can the world do to get our arms around that problem and begin to solve that problem? And pretending that you're, you're on the green side because you're taxing airlines because they're flying and still using the traditional jet fuel because that's the only two fuels av available to them, is, um, it's, it's, it's poor public policy, in my humble opinion. Thank you very much, um, Jeff. So I have another question is, um, how can aviation come to standards to provide safety to boost confidence, example, the wearing of masks? I think we've tried to answer that question earlier. Um, definitely, ICAO can play a role um, on these issues. Um, ICAO normally would take into account um, what states do. They will consult states. Um, in this particular case, ICAO is making a great effort to bring um, member states together under various um, working groups. They have been consulted on, on, on various issues. And definitely, of course, the, um, the, the advice and the views of WHO and the medical personnel uh, within the aviation system. I think people, I, I mentioned earlier about the medical fitness requirements that pilots um, and as well as uh, uh, air traffic controllers have to um, fulfill. Uh, so within the aviation industry, within the regulatory authorities, uh, we do have medical personnel uh, who are now also helping uh, with um, providing advice on, on, on these health related issues so I think that um, 
there will be um, the need to a consensus on how these protection um, measures um, you know need to be to be taken so they'll include things like masks and uh, other personal protective equipment um, the question of uh, safe distancing measures on aircraft and outside aircraft in airports and so on and it, it will be challenging um, because at the moment we can see that different states have different um, requirements but I think there will be an effort to, to harmonize and the ICAO um, cast, um, you know, will 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 see to, um, to to try and achieve a high level of coordination and harmonization, so that it will be tenable and um, sustainable in the long term. Jonathan, do you want to add to that? Um, I, what I would say is that one of the great things about ICAO is that it's a great clearinghouse for um, interesting and productive recommendations and proposals from the 193 states and then some. One of the, one of the I wouldn't call it a silver lining exactly, but one of the benefits that I think will be derived from uh, so many states trying so many things, <clears throat> excuse me, uniquely on their own, is that um, in the wash, these things will be compared and considered and useful and attractive and workable evidence-based uh, techniques will come to the surface while some of the others um, which are, haven't proven their usefulness on an evidence basis, or in fact may even be counterproductive, um, should fall on, of their own weight. Um, that's the kind of thing that we hope we'll see happen. And in, indeed, it's beginning to happen to some extent now. I might just go back for a moment uh, in talking about the use of bilateral arrangements to provide a basis for the resumption of air travel. Um, bilateral arrangements can form a model, I think as was suggested, for multilateral arrangements. And although Australia and New Zealand, which are very close in many ways, um, had rather different approaches to managing the uh, pandemic within their own states and that generated a little bit of criticism back and forth for a variety of reasons, but they are now in the process of developing a travel bubble uh, based on the recognition that if both states can and have the will, as they do, I think, put in place um, equivalent mechanisms for managing uh, health and safety uh, health in terms of safety for passengers embarking and disembarking from both countries, there can be a resumption of travel between the two countries. And I think that kind of approach um, on, a, on a multilateral level, I think is probably the way to go. So there's lots to be learned from that. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, we have reached the 90 minute mark, but I believe we have a lot of questions. So I understand from the organizers that I can with the indulgence of the uh, participants, extend this by a couple more questions. I hope that is in order. And the first of the last two questions, uh, what are the views of international organizations like ICAO or IATA on the COVID-19 as a force majeure um, event? Well, uh, I guess I'm representing an international organization, so I'll take that <laughs> one. Um, We've had some very funny questions uh, that have come to us, even from our member airlines, saying, Ayata, you, you're this big international organization. Would you please declare that COVID-19 represents a force majeure so that we can get out of all of our contracts? And I, I just had to, I had to giggle uh, because the idea that this trade association could somehow pronounce on contracts uh, governing the rights and obligations of thousands of parties, contracts to which we are not a party, <laughs> was uh, a strange proposition in the extreme. So we said, no, uh, we, we can't really do that. Uh, and in fact, every contract has to be evaluated on its own terms and its own facts. Um, we all know that. And so um, my, my guess is that to the extent that force majeure makes sense in the context of a particular contractual instrument, the parties will acknowledge that and, uh, and take the appropriate steps, but in many cases, uh, it might not actually work. Force majeure is a tough test to pass, as most people know. It's not just that it's uh, difficult for you to meet your obligations. It has to be literally impossible in most in most interpretations and in most jurisdictions. Uh, that's what I know. And so force majeure does, unfortunately uh, for my member airlines, does not represent 
a way to get out of uh, obligations very easily in most cases. Thank you very much. So um, the last question before I ask the speakers whether they want to have any final last words. Uh, what is the prognosis for low cost carriers after this period of COVID-19? Would the traveling public still be able to enjoy low cost air travel? I think Jeff, you'll have to take this question, but maybe I'll ask yeah, no, Jonathan I think you're... whether you also want to say something. Je Jeff, please go ahead. Yeah. I hope Jonathan does. I'd love to hear. <laughs> no, uh, look, I mean, the, the low cost model, first of all, is predicated on, on a couple of things. It's um, predicated on filling up every seat, <laughs> not leaving the middle seat empty. Every seat has to be <laughs> filled. Um, and the airplane has to be turned in 20 minutes. I mean, the, the way in which low cost carriers keep their costs low in order to provide low prices is to get the, the most use out of their assets that they can. And so uh, anybody that's flown EasyJet or Ryanair knows what happens in Europe. I mean, you are lined up well before the airplane even arrives. And as soon as the people get off the airplane and there's a crew that runs through it and cleans it and you're on and you're off at 20, and that airplane does lots and lots of rotations in the course of a single day and that enables uh, that enables a low cost carrier to exist and still be profitable. Query whether or not that model is going to work very well if indeed there has to be a, a, an extensive disinfection of the aircraft between flights, between every flight, if in fact social distancing is required as part of the boarding process. I, I think we, we will see a real effort by low cost carriers to, to come back into the market and to stimulate the market in the way they do. But um, whether it's going to be as robust a part of the business as it has been in the past, I personally hope so, because it is the low cost phenomenon is what democratized aviation and what challenged all the legacy carriers to be much more efficient than they were before. Uh, they are an incredibly important part of the industry, but it is going to be I think the, the recovery process will be a uniquely challenging process for the low cost sector of the, of the industry, perhaps more than any other. Um, but uh, they're pretty resilient, so let's hope for the best. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, uh, so I'm going to, you want to say something else? Go ahead. No, I was going to ask if Jonathan had anything to add from the perspective of I would say at the risk of sounding naively um, optimistic is that necessity is in fact the mother of invention and we've already seen some examples uh, to some extent in the aviation industry you've seen it in some of our fly in fly out operations some um, um, very interesting um, innovations being introduced to manage more effectively and more efficiently a difficult situation um, without um, as great an encroachment on capacity as might otherwise have been expected. So I, I like you, Jeff, um, I think they will be resilient. Will it ever be what it once was? Difficult to say, but it may be something different and potentially even better. It remains to be seen. Thank you very much. I'm going to um, try and wrap it up uh, soon. I'll, I'd like to ask uh, Jing Song whether he has anything else that he would like to add before we come to a close soon. Jing Song, you have anything else you want to say? Last one. I can't hear. No more words. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Jeff, Jonathan, any last words before we close? No, I think it's been a great conversation and thank you for leading it so well. I think we've covered some very interesting topics and uh, lots of food for thought. Um, thank you very much. Um, we just say, I've, I've learned a lot and I'm glad to have participated. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you. Um, it's been a great pleasure. You've made my job very easy. So I'm going to say thank you to everyone and, um, to, and, and just to say for aviation, please remain um, confident in us, I think we can make it together. So I'll hand this back over to the organizers. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chue, Jeff, Jonathan, and Jing Song for your sharing your knowledge and time with us. And to our audience, if you enjoyed this session, you may want to join us again next Wednesday, 3rd of June, when we discuss the impact of COVID-19 to international shipping. And if you missed any of our past sessions, the recordings are available at CIL's website. Have a nice evening and goodbye.